Test 1, 2, Test 1, 2. Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending June 7th. First up, this is kind of an interesting story here. This is about Comcast, and uh, for all true disclosure, I am a Comcast customer myself. I was a dissatisfied customer many years ago and quit Comcast because the customer service was just horrible. And I will have to admit they talked me into it, and the customer service is a little bit better than it used to be. And uh, basically most of the time I am satisfied. I just use Comcast now for Internet, not for uh, any kind of te television or anything like that. It's strictly a Comcast Internet service. But anyway, this is an interesting article. Comcast Commercial claims their fast in-home Wi-Fi can make your offline game work better. It's uh, kind of a sarcastic title. They don't really tell you that the fact that this uh, actor here is posing as Mr. Comcast. And it's funny because the video, they pulled it. There was one video on YouTube. I, I watched it two days ago. All you'll be able to see now is a screen capture on the very top of this article. But they pulled it, and I cannot find any more copies. So Comcast must have hit up YouTube and even all the other major video sites and are not letting anybody post any copies. But it's a little bit embarrassing here. Uh, Mr. Comcast gets the game players playing Trials Fusion and he asks, do you notice any buffering? And the gamers happily reply that they do not. Well, yeah, you're not going to have any buffering to do with online if the game doesn't play online. I guess this particular game, not that I'm really familiar with it, and if for some reason the article is wrong, but uh, according to this and the reviewers, the Trials Fusion does not have an online mode, does not have an online multiplayer mode, anything like that. So um, these people are strictly playing it off of a disk or a hard drive. So how would you notice anything and what difference would Comcast make? You could totally disable the Internet connection, but... Supposedly, this is to boost Comcast, and this is kind of interesting. This is from the Consumerist, and as usual, all of the links to all of the articles will be down in the description below. I really wish you could see the video, but as usual, when companies, especially large companies, get embarrassed and they can pull their weight around, they pull these things down fast as can be. I looked and looked, and I cannot find another copy anywhere. If anybody can, um, I would be more than happy to you know, go ahead and post it in, the, to, um, in your comments below because uh, it is interesting to watch knowing what they're trying to pull off here. Okay, this next one is from the American Thinker. Scientists confesses he made up polar bear population estimates. This is really interesting because this has been the uh, mantra of the global warm uh, global warming community and I'm not saying I totally disagree with global warming either. I think global warming is taking place, but there is a lot of room for debate and gray area in there too and as, as far as what can be effective to uh, and what is causing global warming. So um, this is not uh, to get in an argument about that, but just the fact that even if you do support an opinion, using correct facts is a, a better idea. And this was actually called to attention first by um, a lady called Dr. Susan Crawford, who publishes the website Polar Bear Science. And she documents how a scientist responsible for an almost alarmist, low-fall estimate of polar bear population is backing away from numbers that she has been questioning. So she is an expert, and she has had some problems with these numbers that they've been putting out. And uh, here, just to give you a little bit about it here, it is important. This is the statement that they released, the Circumpolar Polar Bear Action Plan, the ones that actually gave out these numbers that everybody is using as scientific fact. This is their statement themselves. It is important to realize that this range never had been an estimate of total abundance in a scientific sense, but simply a qualified guess given to satisfy public demand. In other words, it was probably only slightly better than just pulling facts out of their behind is uh, the polar bear estimates and actually some people and some polar bear experts are saying some subgroups of the polar bear are actually increasing in numbers because of the global warming so um, you know if you want to support a view and I find this a lot of times especially on Facebook I get into arguments with friends about this all the time too and even for views that I support um, don't present something supporting your view that is based on fraud or based on statistics just pulled out of someone's behind. I mean, that makes you look like a nut, even if the case and the cause you're supporting is valid. Um, check out your facts and stuff. Don't, I, I get a feeling that some of the people on Facebook, they just look at a headline that supports something they believe in, and then they just post it up on Facebook, not checking out whether it's based on anything scientific whatsoever or anything like that. In fact, I think that's going to be in the future one of the one-subject shows I'm going to do about that, scientific uh, fraud versus scientific fact and uh, people just jumping on headlines. But anyway, on to the next one, and this has to do with something that's near and dear to my heart, and a friend of mine, 
Um, I consider him a friend. I did meet him one time and get, get a chance to talk to him at length. Steve Gibson from Security Now. Um, this is the headline, True Crypt's Abrupt Demise, Puzzling and Bizarre. If you've been following and you're into encryption, especially like me, if you're a fan of True Crypt, um, this kind of uh, took me by surprise that uh, evidently all the developers, which basically they've kept themselves anonymous, even though they call this an open source project and it's a semi-open source project, but all the developers basically just shut down shop and told everybody, hey, um, don't trust TrueCrypt anymore. Go use a Windows BitLocker instead and use that for all your encryption. But according to Steve Gibson, TrueCrypt is still secure. They've done one audit of it already, and they're going to do a more deep audit the next time around. But all they've ever found is just minor mistakes in programming, nothing to do with it um, being less than secure or anything like that. So they're thinking now these guys being concerned about uh, security with TrueCrypt being shut down is just the fact of protecting people from any bugs that may be discovered in the future. But I also have some good news about this too, although TrueCrypt does seem to be at least stopping development. Um, as far as the original developers, it does seem like it's going to actually live again. Maybe not under the name TrueCrypt, but if you actually go to a site, and this is a, a site based in Switzerland called TrueCrypt.ch, they are actually, there's actually a group that are getting together as volunteers and they're going to resurrect um, TrueCrypt, possibly and more likely under a new name, but it will still be the same basic program. I think as far as a functioning encryption program, I love the fact that it's on-the-fly encryption. You can take files and make them into fake uh, hard drives, open them up and treat it just like a hard drive on your machine, and when you close it off, everything's encrypted and there's nothing left, no evidence left, so if you... Uh, want to keep some of your personal documents private, if you want to keep your financial information private, maybe uh, you want to keep all your passwords private, I would say uh, my best idea is to lock them into a uh, nice TrueCrypt container. And I will also post the link to uh, Steve Gibson uh, where he talks about on the top of this uh, article on TrueCrypt, yes, TrueCrypt is still safe to use. So. Um, I like him as a security expert. I trust his judgment. Uh, like I said, I met him and talked to him in person at a conference for about a half an hour. Great guy, and uh, I'm sticking with TrueCrypt myself. There are plenty of alternatives out there. In fact, there are some that probably are every bit as good as TrueCrypt, but you're going to pay money for them, too. I think there's one, I'm not sure what the name of it is, out of Germany that does pretty much the same thing, same thing TrueCrypt does, but you're going to pay money for it. So. Um, I would say if you need something that secure that you're thinking the NSA is going to come and knock on your door and take something from you, you better probably even get something better than TrueCrypt. You better get something that's uh, got some kind of encryption like a one-time pad or something like that. And last up, this is kind of unusual. I've got two versions of this. One is the news report from the BBC and the other one is from Fox News. Traces of another world found on the moon. There's always been this theory that a planet maybe about the size of Mars or even possibly larger crashed into Earth and that was how the moon was formed. And they're giving, actually they're giving this other planet a name, Thea, which actually to me is kind of weird. You know, you'd think if there's another planet that's as large or larger than Mars that crashed into Earth, um, basically, wouldn't both of them be combined Earth and what was before would be, call it maybe proto-Earth? But anyway, this um, going back to this, the BBC article's got a nice video, and then um, a lady scientist called Dr. Carolyn Smith talks about it. Um, really interesting writing, but if you want a little bit more of the details, I would suggest you go to the Fox News report where they talk about what they're basing this guess on, that maybe uh, based on some moon rocks, they've actually found evidence of this planet Thea. Uh, it's because of the fact of a difference of 0.012% more oxygen-17 seven, than found on Earth. Um, this is oxygen with an extra neutron um, in the middle. So it's something that, especially when you get into meteorites and stuff like that and asteroids, uh, there is a difference, too, in the oxygen-17 levels now. A lot of people aren't really convinced just because of this small of a difference that this is definite proof that there, the moon did form with a, a two planets colliding together. Um, there's a, another theory that uh, maybe the uranium concentration got so high, about 1,800 miles down in the Earth's crust, that it actually caused an explosion and blew off a section of the Earth, and that's how the moon formed. But uh, this is some pretty interesting reading, and uh, yeah, they said they even the people that are saying this is a, a good guess are saying they need a little bit more samples, too. They, they don't have enough sampling to really say they would stick behind this as a definite theory, but uh, yeah, some, some kind of interesting reading if you get a chance to read these two articles. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.